just know if you do unmute your camera or unmute your mic or, you know, say something, it will be recorded. Um, so thank you again, everybody, for joining us this morning. We are so excited because we have a real gem here with us this morning. Um, so we have Michelle Kidwell, who's here from Chesapeake College Plan, and we just love her in the, in the counseling office. We adore her because she has so much good information to share with our students and parents. Um, so Michelle, without further ado, I just want to go ahead and, and turn it over to you. Okay, thank you. And thank you, Jessica. That was very kind. I'm very happy to be doing this work with you at Calvert High School. And we do actually um, spend some time in each county high school during the week to work with students on any um, college applications and financial aid applications, anything from you know starting to research careers in colleges, completing the applications to finding scholarship resource, resources and helping students with those applications as well. So anything that your student may be needing assistance with, um, they can reach either myself or Mrs. Marianne Boyle is at Huntingtown High School. I'm at the other three high schools and we are happy to assist them. Um, you can either reach out directly to us or through us. And we do have weekly sessions in each high school during the um, lunch period. So, um, your counselors have asked me today to talk about the college admissions process, and this is um, relevant to juniors, and that's why we're doing it here at the Junior Parent Breakfast today. Um, this is the time, if your student has, this is the time for them to be beginning. So that's why I've been invited today to share this information with you. So, okay, if you can go to the next slide, please. Okay, so when we talk about college admissions, we want to tell students that they're looking for best fit colleges. Because there's thousands, three or four colleges in the US for students to be considering. So when we talk about best fit, we have four different um, areas that we consider. So the first one would be academic, the next is social, and then on the other two, on the other slide are the other two, which are financial and return on investment. So we, we academic um, fit, and we are talking about the chance of being admitted to the college and whether or not your students are going to be happy there. If you can just do a little click, Jessica, it'll, it'll give up our topics under that. Thank you. Um, so that means that we are, we are considering your students' GPA and test scores, if they have test scores available. And what you wanna do when you're researching colleges is to, is to kind of look, some colleges, if they require tests, they usually have a range or a GPA range that they're looking for. Um, so you kind of wanna see if your student is in that range. Now, if they're not, it doesn't mean that they won't get in and it doesn't mean that they shouldn't apply but it just means that it might be a tip for them to get in there. However, saying that we do encourage students to have some reach schools on there because absolutely sometimes they will get into those reach schools. Um, they also want to consider whether or not the college has their de desired course of study. So it's really important for them to be looking at majors that are offered at the colleges. And if they're undecided to just make sure that there is a wide range, a wide variety for when they do decide what they want to major in. In addition, you're gonna be talking about um, the academic culture of the school. So basically, you know, how big are the classes? Um, how accessible are the professors? What kind of support services do they have in place? Um, and that's all something that you can usually find on the college's website. If you do a college visit, which we do encourage, you can always talk to the admissions um, office about those things as well. Um, social is the kind of the one that I think most people are, uh, they already pretty much know what that is. You know, does your, what does your student want in a college? Do they want a large college, a small college? Do they want to be in the city, in the suburbs, in a rural area? Um, to be an athlete on campus? And if so, do they want a division one, two, three? Um, are they interested in club or intramural sports? So these are things that you can also find on the website of the colleges. 
and just um, kind of make sure that whatever your child is interested in, they have that available to them. Um, other things to consider socially are, you know, students on campus, the distance from home, <clears throat> excuse me, <clears throat> whether or not they want um, a religious affiliation with the school. Those are all things that, um, again, you can just get from the college website and most importantly from visiting colleges. Okay, if you can head to the next one, please. My little blurb about visiting. And you can visit. That's one th good thing that kind of did come out of COVID is that a lot of colleges now have those virtual tours and virtual information sessions. So if you're not sit in person, um, I certainly recommend those. Um, and if you are able to visit in person, then we recommend that you do that when there are students on campus, just so they kind of get a, a what the vibe of the students is on, on campus. And then the last two are the financial fit and the return on investment. So right now is the time to kind of have a, a frank conversation with your students about college affordability if you haven't done that yet, just so they kind of know, you know, like college is very expensive and what your family is prepared for. Um, and of course, there is financial aid available and we caution you to be very careful about taking reasonable debt. So um, if you are considering what unreasonable debt would be, you can see there's a little blurb right there. The rule of thumb is to not borrow any more over the four years of college or five or six student might take to get through college, to borrow no more than their first years and um, and that way it makes it less burdensome for them when they are having to make repayments and trying to also start their lives financially on their own. That being said, we do recommend that you do not eliminate colleges from your student list for now, because many colleges do offer substantial financial aid, especially particularly if your family has great financial need. So just kind of keep, you can keep those schools on the list until you get your financial aid offers. And then, you know, it might be a little easier to explain to your student when you kind of figure out the out of whether or not schools are a good financial fit for them. So we do recommend that you include at least one college that you think you could afford if you weren't really offered significant financial aid. Um, that usually is an in-state school, just based on the um, in-state tuition rate. It's much more affordable. Um, so we do recommend also for that reason that you in school on the financial aid application because there are some significant um, state financial aid grants that students can only use in the state of Maryland. And then finally, you want to consider um, the return on investment you're getting from your college. So certainly should be looked at as a business investment and you wanna consider how much you're spending they also on um, what your student might be earning when they graduate. All right, we can head on to the next one. Okay, so that's kind of the the four fit that you want to consider and then this slide just gives you some options of where you can do that research to learn about the colleges um, i really like big future because they have a scholarship opportunity that when students are creating a college list and searching for scholarships and maybe years and taking all these certain steps on the path to college admissions, they um, offer the opportunity to be entered into scholarship drawings. And I'll get to that a little bit later on in the presentation. But um, that is a really good one that I usually, when I'm sitting down with students, if they haven't started researching colleges, that's the one I usually pull up. The other ones are really fine. And you might want to, you know, do a couple of different ones to kind of compare what they're saying about them. 
Um, but I do recommend that if you are using these college websites, the search websites, that you always verify the information on the college's actual website because I have found mistakes, particularly with financial aid deadlines and application deadlines. So these are just a, a few to um, get you started. And at the beginning, you're probably gonna wanna get like a 15 school list. It seems like a lot, but it'll be easy to eliminate colleges as the research continues on. So you wanna have a good group of colleges that you're working with as you start out. All right, next slide, please. Um, if you are not quite ready to research the colleges um, because they don't maybe know what they want to study, I would recommend that you go ahead and start with maybe some career research. Um, Big Future has also a, uh, a career search in there. You can do like answer some questions and it'll give you some ideas of what your student might be interested in or align with, their interests might align with for them to do a little bit further research. The one that the school system uses is this Zello world. And they also have some of those interest assessments and skills assessments. And then another one that I wish I had put on here that I, I didn't is career once. They have a, um, a few interest surveys and they're, um, then after you answer the questions, it'll come up with a list of careers your student might want to do a little bit more research into. Um, sometimes they're really kind of odd things, but sometimes that actually gives them um, they hadn't considered before. So those are good resources if your student needs a little more help in kind of figuring out what they might want to study beyond high school. All right, next slide, please. Okay, so once your student has that list of 15 schools or so, um, and figuring out like, okay, this is the one, these are the ones I'm really interested in applying to. Um, these are the components of a college application. These are the things that they're going to complete for most of the colleges that they're applying to. Usually there is, well, always there's an application form. It can be on the Common App, which is, um, a website that has hundreds, like 800 different college on it. If your student has two, at least two colleges that use the Common App, I do recommend that they go ahead and use the Common App to fill out their application form. Some colleges are not on that Common App, so they're going to have to go to the website of the college and either fill out a form or download a form um, to submit. Most colleges require a high school transcript. Some require test scores. Um, back during COVID, when it was difficult for students to sit for SAT and IC ACT tests, those scores became optional for a lot of colleges, and a lot of them are remaining optional. I'll talk a little bit more about that future slide. Um, some colleges require letters of recommendation. Usually you get one from a guidance counselor and one or sometimes two from teachers. Not all colleges, but some require essays and some also require students to submit a resume or an activity list. And there is usually an application. Um, there is the opportunity, those little asterisks are um, there may be the opportunity to get fee waivers. So if those fees are a burden for you and your family, um, please let your counselor know and you may be able to get application fee waivers and test fee waivers as well. All right, next slide, please. All right, just a little bit more about the testing. Um, it is recommended that you check with the individual co colleges about their testing policies. Um, many, many of them are remaining test optional. A lot of them have permanently become test optional, but it's important to understand that if your student has been able to take SAT, 
So in other words, it's like they're, they're um, prepared for the test and they're not sick the day they take it and there's not somebody behind them sick the day they take it and they felt like they were really focused and did as well as they could at that point in time. Um, if they have a test score that um, indicates their ability, it does actually bit of a boost to submit those test scores um, because it just gives admissions officers another criteria on which to evaluate them. So I do recommend that students take the test and I do recommend that if they are, you know, in the range that the college has as advertised on their website, submit those test scores. Um, but it is important to realize that if they have indicated that they're test optional, they are not going to penalize your student if they do not submit those test scores. This can be a little bit confusing. So the next slide, I have um, a couple of articles that you might want to look over. Um, I have to say, you know, I've had a couple students that kind of really struggle with this. Should I, should I not, should I, should I not? And I always kind of encourage them to submit their test scores if they look if they're really close to that range, if they're you know within the range certainly. But even if they're really close to the the lower end of the range, I do recommend that they send those test scores. Uh, next slide, please. Okay, so once your student has researched their careers, their colleges, they put together their applications, they submit those applications. Um, these are some of the things that the colleges are gonna be looking for in the students who are applying. Um, this is from the Independent Consultants Association. It's a professional association that I'm a member of. Um, this is a couple years old, but that's because the landscape of college admissions changed a lot due to the pandemic. But in general, these are kind of how they're going to evaluate your student's application. So the, the number one thing that they're really going to look at is their high school record. They want to see that they're taking challenging courses because they want to be prepared for the, the level of challenge they're going, to play, they're going to face when they get to college. So they are looking for you know, AP classes, honor classes, um, high GPAs in their major subjects their SAT or ACT scores if they are not a test optional school. Um, number four, the participation in meetings. Some students think like, oh, I have to have my hands in everything. I have to be involved in everything because it looks good for my college application. Um, and that will look good for your college application if you are passionately involved in those, in those activities. However, students, students shouldn't put that pressure on themselves to be, you know, have their hands in everything, but really to just kind of their, their passion is. So if, you know, they've been on the, the basketball team since freshman year and they've kind of improved as they've gone along and they've become maybe a captain or a co-captain or something, you know, or if they're lettering every um, year, then those, those are meaningful to them and they should continue um, my own daughter was like involved in everything, but she was like really passionately involved in that stuff. So I couldn't, you know, she kept saying, well, I'm going to do this. I'm going to do this. And I was kind of like, Kelly, you, you don't have time. You can't do that. She's like, yeah, yeah, I think I can. And she, and she did. And it was fine because her grades didn't suffer. And she was really impassionate about them. Um, but I would caution just like doing a little bit here and there and then kind of dropping off because that's not what they want to see. They want to see kind of like a consistent level of engagement in your activities. Um, Well-written essays is the next one. I have a lot of resources for essays, for brainstorming for essays. Um, I think the most important th thing there is to come up with a real um, Again, those activities that they're participating in, you know, the longer you're involved, maybe you learn, move into a leadership position. Um, leadership and service are very big when looking at college applications and when looking at scholarship applications. Personal characteristics, strong letters of recommendation, um, any specific talents that contribute to the campus, intellectual curiosity, 
the student's character and values. And the last one there is demonstrated interest and enthusiasm. And you might be wondering, how do they do that? How do they demonstrate interest and enthusiasm? Um, do the college visits. Your student is receiving email from colleges. You know, open up the email, look at the email, click out the links in the email, go to the website, look around on the website, um, ask questions, you know, reach out to the admissions office, um, ask your representative questions, attend the college visits that the high school has. They have college representatives come and meet with students. Your students should sign up for those. That's how they demonstrate interest. Most colleges, though, don't really include that as um, their evaluating applications. All right, next slide, please. All right, and here's just kind of a, a planning timeline for your juniors. I think Ms. Ponte, I think has um, handouts that she has maybe emailed to you. I did include a couple of timelines for juniors and seniors in that. Um, but you can see by now, if your student hasn't um, taken SATs, I do recommend that they register for the spring SAT. Um, also, it's not a bad time to start looking for scholarships. Of the local scholarships, which are the ones that I really like, most of those are limited to seniors. So this time next year, you will be looking at those. Um, continue to do challenge yourself, take challenging courses, get good grades. Um, I know that you probably are looking at um, registering for your senior courses now. Um, and just one thing to understand uh, right now, I'm sorry, I'm distracted by husband just walked in here. Sorry. Um, He's so handsome. <laughs> um, sorry about that. <laughs> So right now, as you're registering for courses, it is kind of important, interesting to note that colleges would rather see your student take an honors course over an academic course, an honors course and get a B than in an academic course. And likewise, they'd rather see um, students challenging themselves and getting a B in an AP course instead of the A in the honors course. Again, those big future scholarships, I'm gonna talk about them one more time. And then if your student is interested in attending a military academy or um, maybe working towards an ROTC, now's the time to kind of begin that process. It's a little more involved. It does require a couple more steps than the um, normal college application process. So um, I had two sons who applied to military academy, so I'm pretty familiar with it and I'd be happy to help them with that. And then the other thing is to consider documents for financial aid. So when your students apply beginning in October for financial aid, well, hopefully in October, we're getting kind of rumblings about it might not open that early this year, which is kind of concerning, but um, your students will be using the 2022 tax information applications in October. This summer, if they are interested in planning in playing sports in college, either at a division one or two school, school they can um, register with the NCAA. Um, again, that FAFSA opens on October 1st, hopefully, but you are going to be required both a student and a parent to get an FSA ID, which is a login to to um, complete that application. You can do that at any time. So if you want to do that now, that is something that you can do to prepare for that. Um, this summer also maybe get a job, an internship, do some community service. Those are really good experiences that you, they can use as a So I do recommend that they spend their time productively in, in the summer. Also maybe visiting colleges in the summer. Also creating that student resume. If, they're, if they have to go back and think about what they've done throughout high school, maybe the summer is a good time to do it rather than in the fall when they are actually doing their applications and doing their financial aid application. All right. Please. 
All right, here's um, those big future scholarships. So this slide and the next slide give you kind of, I know Ms. Ponte is um, recording this and it could be available for you to click on some of these links to kind of get more information about these scholarships. But you can see the steps that they would have to take to be entered into are listed there at the bottom, Look, starting a career list, building their college list, starting scholarships, strengthening their college list, completing the FAFSA and applying to colleges. So right now, those first three or even four, your student could be doing as a junior and they will be entered monthly into those scholarship drawings for either 500 of those that they award and there's two $40,000 scholarships they award each month. So next slide, please. Hey, Ms. Um, Kidwell. Yes. We had a question, a couple questions in the chat. Okay. I don't know if we want to, um, you know, when someone was asking if, if their student has an IEP and is in honors classes, how does that translate into being in honors classes um, or not for the college application or does that affect anything? Um, I think that would be kind of a question to ask the college that they were applying to. Or is that more of a question of like making the college list? Yeah, and I almost wonder at like what colleges that might be a question they just ask, like, does a student have an IEP? And then they go well, from that, there. Yeah. So for colleges, yeah, that you have to be very proactive. If your student has any accommodations, an IEP, a 504, you have to be very proactive with the colleges on um, getting services in place for them. It's very different than, you know, in, in the obligation is on the school to um make sure those accommodations are met those services are provided but in college they are not obligated to do that it really is on the student and the parent to make sure that any of those um, services are in place for them and there, there was so, another what another question too was any like what kind of things to put on a resume yeah, I have some organizers, like if your student can stop and see me. I'm at Calvert High School on Tuesdays during lunch in the guidance office. Um, I have an organizer that I could give to your student and actually give them some tips on how to do that. But it's things like, you know, extracurricular activities, volunteers, um, any honors and awards they received while they're in high school. Um, you know, any work experience, things like that. Any other questions, Mr. Berlich? That's it right now. Okay. I know too, going back to the IEP thing too, and that, that, that parent, now, you know, any other parent is, I think if you look around there, there are some colleges are maybe more known for accommodating than others. So maybe that keep true. that in mind. That is true. But that's it so far. Okay. All right, so this, this slide is just a little bit more about those big future scholarships. I do encourage pretty much your students just gonna go um, college board account and, and demonstrate that they're taking those steps, you know, researching careers, researching colleges, um, looking for scholarships, and then they're just automatically set, put into those drawings. I like that. I mean, normally I don't like scholarships that are drawings, but because they actually need to be doing these things, I do like that they're trying to encourage and um, offering scholarships for it. All right, next slide, please. And then these are just some things that your student can be doing this summer just to kind of alleviate some of the stress they feel in the fall. As soon as they get back, they're going to hit the ground running. Um, the Common App opens in August. Um, busy put, you know, doing their applications, writing essays, asking for letters of recommendation. It's a lot. Most students have, feel a little bit of pressure or a lot of pressure at that time. So anything they can do this summer to kind of get them ahead of the game is a good idea. Um, they can write a generic admission essay. You know, like I said, August 1st, the Common App opens. Try and get that first application under your belt. 
get that first one done before you even go back to um, school in the fall. I do recommend that students as juniors before they leave, maybe they um, talk with teachers who might be willing to write their letters of recommendation and that way they're already on their radar that willing to write those letters. They're not gonna be inundating teachers in the fall when a lot of other seniors are asking for those letters of recommendation. Also visiting colleges, working on that college list, participating in activities, keeping a summer journal. If they're doing some of those internships or volunteer activities or you know, attending a college for a camp or a program, um, a lot of times, you know, they may not realize it, you'll have that aha moment where you're like, oh yeah, I never really thought about that before. And then it kind of becomes a part of their personal personal philosophy. If they keep a summer journal, that might be something to look back over when it's time for essays to come up with a good essay to topic. And then also planning for standardized testing. I do recommend juniors take it in the again, probably in the fall. Some students take it, you know, more than twice. Every time you take it, your score tends to go up. The first time it usually goes up at least 50 to 100 points. And then it just depends on, you know, how, how much you study after that. But again, searching for scholarships and reading, that's always a good thing for them to do. Next slide, please. And I hope I'm not running too long, but I'm, this is it. <laughs> so again, I'm Michelle Kidwell. I am at Calvert High School every Tuesday in the guidance office. Um, happy to work with your students. If they can't come then, they can email me. We can schedule another time to meet or they can talk to their counselor. I do virtual appointments. I have a Calendly account. Um, and we do offer these same as well. So I hope that wasn't too much. Um, I hope I didn't take too much of your time. Um, but I'm happy to answer some more questions if you need to stick around. I know that counselors might have to pop off here, but um, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to take a few minutes for that. And while I'm giving you time to formulate some questions, I just want to remind everybody that our next junior breakfast will be on Thursday, March 9th, so a month from today, and we will have another guest speaker. We have Christian Zimmerman, who is coming to us from the financial aid office at CSM, and he'll be, he'll be going over the entire financial aid process. So anything from scholarships to FAFSA, giving us some more insight. And he is like amazing. He's one of the best financial aid people, in my opinion, other than Michelle. Michelle's wonderful too, but he oh, really no. knows he, a lot of things. He's the guru. Mm -hmm. So good. Yeah. And even he's if your treasure. student isn't going to be attending CSM, he's really good. He gives the gen general information, but he's very good. So I'm going to put that link in the chat. And then Michelle, we had a question in the chat. How do we find out about special things colleges need, such as auditions for music or special pieces of the application requirements? So every college is going to have that listed on their website. So if you have a particular college that you're interested in, for example, um, MICA, the Maryland Institute College of Art, um, they require a por portfolio when your student is applying. So that might be item on that list of the application process for some of those schools, but definitely on their website, call their admissions office um, and get that information from them that way. Hi, Ms. Goodwell. I have a, a question. Um, you mentioned that sometimes colleges like to see those AP courses with a B versus an honors course with an A. Is it a deal breaker for them to be in honors courses? We just, I honestly kind of steered my son away from an AP course load because he was involved in so many other things that he really wanted to be involved in. And he has, you know, lots of friends and I wanted him to be able to balance all of them. And I thought that if he took all AP that it would be too much for him. Um, he does very well in his honors classes. He has mostly A's. And like I said, he's in so many other, you know, he's in football and he does other sports and he has, you know, his social, you know, calendar with his friends and he balances all that. But is, is it a deal breaker that he's not in AP classes? 
kind of there is no deal breakers. They when they look at the applications, they look at remember that list of 12 things, they look at everything. Okay. So it's it's not, I mean, it really isn't. Um, you know, it'd probably be good if he's getting, you know, if he's getting mostly A's, it'd probably be good if like maybe, you know, whatever, if he's really interested in science, science class or whatever, you know, just to kind of get that that challenge there, that workload there. If the teacher's recommending it and the, you know, you're on board with it and the student's willing to do it. So yeah, it's not really a deal breaker. It's really just kind of a, um, a recommendation to, to challenge themselves so that they are prepared for the college level. Okay, thank you. Yep, yeah, you're welcome. We have any other questions this morning? I know you presented a lot of really good information, Ms. Kidwell, a lot of really good things to think about. Yeah, it's a lot quick, to think about. I have a quick question. I hope you can hear me. Um, just to piggyback on Mary's question with AP, does it matter if the AP classes were taken in sophomore and junior year versus senior year? Yeah, so it's kind of, you know, like I said, it's not a deal breaker. It's just, you know, they're looking to see that the student has themselves. So it really isn't, I mean, I wouldn't worry about it, especially because, you know, it's something that's already happened. No, it's it's wonderful that your student took them in, in 10th or 11th grade. Yeah, that's a, a wonderful thing. Thank you. Mm -hmm. I think a bigger thing to piggyback on that, Ms. Kidwell, is like if a student took a lot of AP courses in like 10th grade and 11th grade and then senior year, because especially now we're in we're in um, we're at a point now where we're looking at scheduling today's registration day. So I know this is a hot topic on a lot of people's minds. But if a student took a lot of AP courses in like 10th and 11th grade and then senior year, they don't really do a whole lot. And I mean, it's not to say that like, and I see a question in the chat about dual enrollment, like AP or dual enrollment. I mean, in my mind, AP and dual enrollment are sort of on the same level because they both are college level courses that mm -hmm. provide an opportunity for students to perform work at a college level. But anyway, if you have a student who really challenges them, challenges themselves in 10th and 11th grade, and then and then in senior year they they take like two classes and leave and don't really have anything else going on, that kind of their transcript takes a nosedive, if you will. They were very involved, really rigorous, and then they're going down to nothing. Um, so that's just something to think about. You want to keep the rigor going all years of high school. I mean, Absolutely. unless of course your student has something else going on, you know, because um, it's all about the context as well of their situation. Um, so to talk a little bit more about AP and dual enrollment, I mean, I think a college looks at them from the same perspective and my college board is not going to be the biggest fan of me for saying this. And I don't know if Mr. Verlich and Ms. Harris, if you guys want to jump in, but if I had a student, I would definitely, I think, be encouraging them to take dual enrollment a little bit more. And my thought behind that is dual enrollment. I mean, nothing is guaranteed, but a college credit from dual enrollment students typically have more opportunities that go into the grading and the ability to earn that college grade. So for example, Comp and Ret is a dual enrollment course that students can take now in junior or senior year for their English class at Calvert High. So their determination of whether or not they earn the college credit is based on a bunch of different assignments that they do throughout the year, throughout the semester, versus the AP course is all about that one test during AP week. So let's say if your student wakes up and they have really bad allergies, my husband's a really bad allergy sufferer, so this is always on my mind, and I know that spring allergies are really bad. So let's say your student wakes up on AP testing day and they have really bad allergies. They're probably not going to be able to focus on that test, and the sole determination of whether or not they get the college credit is based on that exam. So that's just my two cents about the dual enrollment versus AP. And like I said, College Board may come after me for that opinion, but I want to keep it real with everybody. So and then, Michelle, we have another question in, question in the chat. Can parents schedule appointments with you? Yeah, so yeah, yes, I, I do parents. Um, that is to do the financial aid aspect of it. Um, I have like met with parents and I like to have the student there to be involved in the conversation um, because really the students need to start taking the responsibility of making these decisions and taking these actions. So 
students, but I do encourage your student to be available at that time as well. Do we have any other questions this morning? All right, Ms. Kidwell, I think we're all set up this morning. So thank you so much for coming and sharing your expertise because we, you know, we love and appreciate you in the counseling office. We're so lucky to have you. Um, so thank you for coming with us this morning. Oh, you're welcome. And I'm happy to work with you all and to work with the students there at Calvert. So yes, please reach out. Um, happy to be a good resource for everybody. Thank you. Awesome. So all of our parents attending today too, I'm going to email you this presentation and I'm going to email it to you in PowerPoint format just so that you have the ability to click on some of these links. And I will include a couple other handouts that Michelle shared with me as well. So thank you everybody for coming this morning. Um, keep us in your thoughts because it'll be very wild today in the counseling office with registration day. Uh, but if you have any questions, please let us know. Thank you guys for coming this morning. Have a great day. Great.